Demons come out and speak with us. I'm going to have Mr. Mark McCormick come up, um, our executive director, and say a few words for us. And then we're going to go ahead and get into our program. The restrooms are through this door, up the first door on the left, and there's more on the lower level if you need. Okay? Just let us know. And if you did park in the garage, I can stand your um, little ticket so to validate. Okay? I was telling Angela that we should have her come every month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you to the Kansas African American Museum. I'm Mark McCormick. I'm the executive director. And uh, I just want to say a couple of words before we do our formal introduction. Uh, this was brought to you by uh, the Kansas Humanities Council. Uh, they help support um, speeches like this and this kind of information. But, you know, I've known Angela for a little while. We've honored her as a trailblazer, so she's a part of our trailblazer uh, history. So we have another trailblazer here on the front row. But um, you learn a little bit about people, too. I never knew that um, Angela lived in Pasadena. And I was telling her that I'm kind of a transplant, too. Uh, I lived in Oxnard, California, Ventura, California. Oh, you did? Wow. Um, Stayed with my dad in Los Angeles and then you know came back here. So um, you get to learn a little bit about uh, what it means for someone to leave California, come here and work as hard as she has to make history relevant. I'm telling you from experience, it is very hard to make history relevant. And the job that she has done there is simply amazing. So I'm gonna have to to come back and give a formal introduction, but the next voice you'll hear after Jaquita's is Angela. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, I get to do the studious part. <laughs> um, Ms. Angela Bates is the Executive Director of the Nicodemus History Society. Um, she presents educational programs across the nation covering Nicodemus, Exodusters, and the black towns in the West, Buffalo Soldiers, and black women in the West. She's an awesome speaker, gives a great program. She's a great author as well. We do have her um, books available as well. Um, she has a lot of things that she's done so far and the, the historical work that she's done at the Nicodemus um, Center is wonderful. The Historical Society, Society is wonderful. And I see a few people in the crowd that have gone out and it's really a great place to go. Um, the Nicodemus, um, Connection to the Vice President is a program that she'll be presenting today. It's a part of the Kansas Humanities Society, their Council of Speakers Bureau, so she's a part of that as well. Featuring the presentations and discussions that examine our shared human experience and our innovations, culture, and heritage, and conflict. Ms. Angela Bates. Good afternoon. But if they take their shot, I am crack that whip and she wakes up close when they start to sleep. But no, I won't be doing her today. I will be talking to you um, about a very um, intimate and personal uh, story as it relates to Nicodemus' history. It's about um, our connection to a vice president, Vice President Richard M. Johnson. But before I go into that, I'll just tell you just a little bit, and I want to acknowledge my dad who is in the audience. Um, he has been ill, but he's recovered now. And um, I asked him yesterday if he wanted to come with me. He said, yeah, I guess I will. So Dad, will you stand up? This is my father, James Bates. <laughs> it's neat to be able to have uh, one of my parents in the audience. It used to be that every once in a while they would come, it would be my mother and him. And I remember the first time I uh, invited them to come hear me speak, and I was speaking, this was years ago, back in the early 90s, and I was speaking at uh, Fort Hay State, and I was preparing to get up and speak, and my dad says, well, where are your notes? And I said, what notes? He says, your notes, your, your notes that you're going to speak from, and I said, Daddy, they're all up here. I do have some notes to try to keep me on uh, track, because I do have a tendency to just go on and on and on, and it's because the, in the history is so phenomenal. And so how can you say everything that you want to say in an hour? So somebody's going to have to keep track of that. Um, I will try to keep myself in line here, because there is a lot of 
lot I do have to share with you. Um, and I have a tendency to give you as, as much as you want and then even some, um, some additional information that may not even be a part of what I really want to talk about today. But there's so much of the history and everything related. So um, I try to give you as much as you possibly can take and as, as fast as I can say it. Um, I'm a Bates, and Bates is talk real fast. So if I'm talking fast now, I may talk even a little bit faster. So you better keep up. <laughs> um, this program is brought to you by the Kansas Humanities Hi, Dr. Tim. I knew you were going to be here. I didn't even have to call you and tell you. I knew you were going to be here. <laughs> and if you guys think this is going to be a great program, I hope I don't disappoint you. And if this is the first time you've come, you need to come again. Because the history not only yeah, Nicodemus this is important, African American history in the state of Kansas is important. And rich history, uh, African American history has taken place right here in Wichita. So don't make this your last time of coming here. It's a great place. All of our history is great. You may be surprised. There may be another speaker that's better than me. <laughs> um, I was born in Joaquin, Kansas, which is about 35 miles from Nicodemus in 1952. I'm not ashamed to say that. I just turned. 62 a week ago, so I'm very blessed to be uh, able to say I've made it to 62. I had uh, two siblings that did not make it that far, so I'm blessed to be able to say that I had a, uh, a birthday last week and I'm 62 years old. But my parents moved to California, and both of them are originally from Nicodemus, but they moved to California when I was about four or five years old, and we moved to Southern California. We lived in Los Angeles for about a year, and then we moved over to Pasadena. Um, and then they bought a house in Altadena, which is right at the foothills of the um, San Gabriel Mountains, right there in the Los Angeles basin. Um, so I grew up in Pasadena, but we spent at least two weeks every summer coming to Nicodemus for the, eman the annual emancipation celebration. So I always knew home where home was. Even though I grew up in Pasadena, home was Nicodemus. It was home to my parents and their parents and their parents. So the great, great grandparents going all the way back to those original settlers um, I'm connected to. So I've always been um, interested in our uh, family history and the history of, of Nicodemus, so much so that it's been my profession for the last 25, 30 years. So I am blessed not only to be 62, but I am blessed to have such a rich history of uh, being a descendant of Nicodemus. OK, enough of that. Um, I moved here in 1989, though. I lived in Washington, D.C., just a little bit more. I lived in, uh, I graduated from high school in 1970, ended up going to school with BTK in El Dorado, Kansas. Yes, I did. Didn't know him at the, thank, at the time, thank God. But when I found out about who he was and when he went to school and he was at Butler County, I pulled out my, uh, uh, my yearbook, and there he was. I said, I'm, I'm so glad I didn't know him. <laughs> um, but anyway, and then I went to Emporia and got my degree in education and psychology, moved to Washington, D.C., um, and Newport, Rhode Island, lived, lived in, that, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area for about 13 years, moved to Denver, Colorado, was there for about six or eight years, and been in the Nicodemus area now for about 20, almost 25 years. You add it all up, and I'm 62. <laughs> um, so anyway, I had a passion for the history growing up. And then in, 19, um, in the 1980s, when I moved to Denver, I had a chance to come home on the weekends. And my parents had retired and, and um, bought one of the farms, and they were living there. So I could come home on the weekends, and my son loved coming home. So I just decided that, you know, it was time for me to step up to the plate as my cousin Burl Schweitzer said, and it's time to take the baton and do something to preserve the history of Nicodemus. So I did. I started our Nicodemus Historical Society and the rest of the history. Okay. I gotta turn this thing on first. And I am not electronically set, but I think I could push this button. I thought I could. See? <laughs> Maybe I need to turn it on. I turn it off. Somebody else. <laughs> I've got a cell phone that still has an antenna. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. Do I need to point this somewhere? Okay. Keep back it up there. Do I point it at that? Okay. Okay. I think I got it straight now. Um, in, in about 1995, 96, 
Uh, I got married to a guy by the name of Barry Tompkins, who is a blacksmith farrier from Kentucky. And when I brought him out, uh, he told the story that uh, he was emancipated. So I brought him all the way from Kentucky. So, but he still <laughs> felt like he was a slave. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the reason I mentioned him is because uh, right before we got married, I was in the newspaper, uh, there was a newspaper article that was in the uh, Lexington and Georgetown newspaper where the people were originally from. And uh, his sister, who I had an opportunity to meet, said, oh yeah, there was this lady that was in, um, uh, from Nicodemus, uh, that was from Georgetown. I said, no, I was in Georgetown and I'm from Nicodemus and that was me. And she went on and on kind of debating with me and he said, it was her. <laughs> and, and he said, then what's the big deal? And she said, don't you remember when we had our family reunion that we found out we were related to the babies? I said, oh, we don't need to discuss this anymore because I ended up getting married to him. So I ended up marrying him anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, the connection, um, the, Nicodemus' connection to a vice president. They had a dream and they made it a reality. These were my great, great, and then my great, great, great grandfathers who were a part of the original settlers that came to Nicodemus. So this story and this presentation is about them and their connection with Nicodemus. And you know, it wasn't until probably the mid um, 90s that I ran across uh, my cousin, great cousin Luva Craig's document, which was at the University of Kansas. And I started reading the stories about those first settlers. And I ran across the story of John Samuel. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, who were they? I should be following these notes. See, it's hard for me to do this. Um, who was Vice President Richard Johnson and who are his former slaves? Um, Vice President Richard M. Johnson was Vice President under Martin Grand Dan Buren um, in the 1830s, as you can see. Um, to put it in a context that you guys can probably relate to, remember the movie Amistad? Okay, the president at that time was Van Buren and the vice president was Richard M. Johnson. Um, Richard M. Johnson actually married his slave. Um, this is a very interesting story. That is why I think um, it is, is, is pertinent that I tell the story because here is uh, a, a white man who owned slaves, but he never married anyone other than three of his slaves. He never married a white woman. And he married his slave by the name of Julia Chen. And he had two daughters by her. Um, their names were Imogene and Adeline. And uh, when he uh, was the vice president under um, Martin Van Buren, and he was the first vice president to actually be um, elected by Congress opposed to the people. And when he was the vice president, oh, they made these political cartoons about him because they said, how dare you make a mockery of the United States uh, second highest position, which is a vice presidency, by marrying your slave and parading your daughters around. And uh, he said he didn't care what the public thought. He didn't care what anyone thought. He said he loved Julia Chen and he was making no bones about it. And because he was white and because they, the family was wealthy, they were part of the families that actually settled uh, and, and established Kentucky, he didn't care. And so they made fun of him and he just didn't care. And he said, I know what I'm doing is right in the eyes of the Lord. And Lula Craig's document uh, talks about how he got married to Julia Chen and, uh, and who married them and um, how uh, Tom, my great grandfather, was told to go and get uh, fabric, go into town and uh, take Julia and get fabric so they could uh, make a, a, a wedding dress. And then he wasn't even sure what was really getting ready to happen. And he told them to go down to the quarters and make sure they were going to have music and food and all of this being prepared for this big wet, wedding uh, feast. And he said, well, who's getting married? And he said, I am. I'm marrying Julia Chan. And his mother tried her best to get him to, uh, you know, date white women, but he wasn't having it. She was given to him as a gift um, as a housekeeper when, he, when his father died and the land was being split up. So Julia was his slave uh, housekeeper. 
Um, and he said he fell in love with her and she with him. And they had two daughters and they publicly educated them and they paraded them around, so to speak, as some people would say. But he didn't care. Um, and so they made these political cartoons about him at the time. Well, uh, this picture isn't very good and it's good on my computer, so I don't know why it's not good up there. But anyway, <coughs> that's his daughter, Ima Jean, with her husband by the name of Daniel Pence. Now, their daughter, um, and what have you, and was uh, there taking care of the household and the business when he was away at D in Washington, D.C. But she married a man by the name of Daniel Pence. And she was really a quadroon, I think that's what the right terminology is. Um, and so she looked very, very fair, and they could really pass for, for white, but everybody knew that her mother was Julia Chen. Now, Vice President Richard M. Johnson actually owned my great-great-grandfather on my mother's side, um, and he had a wife by the name of Serena. So he was actually the slave of uh, Vice President Tom, uh, Richard M. Johnson. And of course, he took the name Johnson after the Johnson, the White Johnson family. But here's a, a photograph that we have in our collection of him and his wife, or my great-great-grandmother, Zermina. So they came in 1877 with the first group that established Nicodemus. Now, on my dad's side of the family, um, his daughter, Imogene, actually owned my great-great-great-grandfather. His name was John Samuels, and his wife was Leanna. So these are my great-great-great-grandparents who were actually owned by Vice President Richard M. Johnson's uh, daughter, Imogene. They had a dream. After freedom uh, and emancipation occurred in Kentucky, um, people, uh, the former slaves basically did sharecropping, but uh, the, the land in uh, Kentucky, especially that central bluegrass area, um, was really not conducive to large farms. That's the way it is really in the entire state. And um, at one time, there was just 5% of a white population that actually owned slaves in Kentucky. Um, and they grew hemp. And all you guys know what hemp is? Mm -hmm. Who doesn't know what hemp is? Okay, we have some. You can go to Colorado and get you some. <laughs> well, in, in Kentucky, it was not uh, cotton. Uh, uh, tobacco wasn't keen, so to speak, in terms of crops until after uh, the Civil War. It was hemp. They grew hemp, and they had rope factories. And so um, a lot of the slaves after emancipation um, occurred, they stayed on, so to speak, at these rope factories and the plantations. Uh, and a lot of them were skilled workers. But uh, actual sharecropping was just not that profitable. And it just, you just didn't have that kind of situation like you would have had in, say, the Carolinas or Mississippi and other places where they had large plantations and large numbers of slaves. So Kentucky was one of these states that really kind of had the corner of the market on mulatto and quadroon and mixed women, uh, with mixed blood women that they sold to the Louisiana market. That's what they really prided themselves in in terms of their slaves during that time period. But anyway, um, so after emancipation, um, of course, we know that the Jim Crow laws came into existence and they tried to re-enslave African Americans almost immediately. Um, of course, the uh, Freedmen's Bureau came into existence to assist African Americans in terms of educating them, providing loans for them, uh, renegotiating or negotiating their, uh, uh, with their former masters with, with regards to getting wages and what have you. So it was a very volatile time and Kentucky did, was not exempt from the, uh, the violence and the cruelty that was taking place. Um, and so just like other places in the South, people were looking for a way to experience freedom. Um, and what was going on out here in the West, of course, here in the great state of Kansas and in Nebraska, they had uh, the Homestead Act had taken place and uh, people could come to the West and could homestead and get basically uh, government land for little of nothing. And so you have Kansas being the real pool in terms of the land, and then you have uh, the push is you know the volatility of the environment and the lifestyle that people were experiencing after emancipation there in the South, all the Jim Crow laws, all the violence. That was really the push. 
And so what was the catalyst to get those people out here? It really was a man by the name of W.R. Hill, who was really responsible for uh, getting people to settle in parts of Wichita and Hutchinson. And he ventured all the way out in the West and said, oh my God, I can see all the way to Colorado. There's nothing out here. I'm going to be in town and call it, uh, and name it after myself, which he did, called Hill City. Well, Hill City was one of his ventures. The other venture was Nicodemus. So he met um, some African-American uh, ministers in Topeka, but he met a black man by the name of Smith who was a homesteader out there, convinced him to go into partnership with him, and then they went to Topeka, met the ministers, and then they created the Nicodemus Town Company, uh, planted the town, and they said, okay, now where are we gonna get people to settle out here? I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere. So they said, well, why don't we go back home? And home was Kentucky. So they went back to Kentucky, and they promoted the town of Nicodemus. And they went to the churches, and Vice President Richard M. Johnson's family um, and the slaves that were on his plantation, and they owned um, what's equivalent to about two counties here. Um, now, in the state of uh, Kentucky, those two, which would be equivalent to two counties, have been reduced down to two counties, Woodford County and, uh, hmm, my mind just went blank, that happens when you get 62. <laughs> So bear with me. Anyway, uh, so that county has been split into two, but their family owned the equivalent to what we would say would be two counties. Um, and I don't know where I was going with that, so I'll just keep going. <laughs> I'll come back to it. But anyway, the people basically came out uh, to Nicodemus because the town promoters went to the churches. And they went to the Georgetown, a couple of the Georgetown churches and promoted the town of Nicodemus. And uh, the blacks that were a part of the Johnson clan belonged to the Georgetown Baptist Church. And that's where one of the churches that they went and promoted the town. So that's how they heard about the free land and the town that they thought they were going to go settle in called Nicodemus. So Tom and Zarina... When they came in 1877, they were a part of a group of about 350 people that said, yes, we want free land. We want to experience freedom on free soils in the state of Kansas. So they were a part of that 350 people that made the trek in September of 1877. So Tom and Zarina had three adult children. They had a son by the name of Henry, a daughter by the name of Emma, and a daughter by the name of Ella. When they came out, they were adults. And uh, Emma is my great-grandmother. She's pictured there really kind of on the left-hand side of the, the photograph that you're seeing on the right side. Well, Emma was pregnant at the time, um, and her husband uh, was a man by the name of Charles Williams. And Charles didn't come with the first group. Um, he said, I'll come because another group was being planned to come in the spring. So he said, I'll come in the spring. So she went with her uh, siblings and her parents to Nicodemus. Um, and she had the first baby that was born in Nicodemus. Um, and she named him after her brother Henry, which was a very common practice during that time period. You named your daughters after your sisters and your sons after your brothers. So she named the first baby that was born in Nicodemus, which was October the 30th, 1877, Henry. Henry Williams was his name. Um, Henry, the, her brother actually homesteaded, let me back that up, uh, actually homesteaded along with his two sisters and their parents. Um, and this, even though you can't see it, see this is what's wrong with technology, it looks great on this computer, but <laughs> which actually can't read the thing. But those are the homestead papers of Henry uh, Johnson, his uncle, that he was named after. So they homesteaded in Nicodemus, and uh, the Johnson homestead, Tom Johnson and Zarina's homestead, is where they had the first Baptist church services. Um, he helped to actually organize uh, the Nicodemus First Baptist Church, and they held the first services in his dugout. And in the spring, um, after the fall, they actually had uh, the first baptism on the spring there called Spring Creek. Again, this is a horrible picture, I don't know what's wrong, but the boy that's standing, person that's standing in the center that you cannot see his head, that's him. <laughs> and that is Emma and her husband Charles that are seated there. And to Charles's right, you all's left, is my grandfather, my mother's father, um, Charlie Williams. And then the other children are, uh, I could go on about them, but 
I can tell you that there's a little girl in the back with a black dress on, you can't see her face. That is Girl Schweitzer's grandmother. Um, most of the people that live in Nicodemus today, and there ain't that many, really, there's only about 10, but over the last 50 to 60 years, the people that have actually occupied the town of Nicodemus are, most of them, except for maybe two families, are descendants of this particular family, the, uh, the Williams family. Okay, just a point of reference in terms of my genealogy back to, to uh, Tom and Zarina Johnson, their daughter, Emma, uh, married Charles, and Charles married a woman by the name of Elizabeth Risby. And my grandmother, uh, Elizabeth, actually grew up in Abilene. When they came in with the second group in the spring, there was a measles epidemic going on at the time, and her mother had a, had a child that had died, in route, and when the conductor found out, they put them off the train in Solomon, and they ended up walking back to Abilene. And so she grew up in Abilene, and she went to school with Eisenhower. And she graduated from high school, and she went on to normal school, and she ended up be, becoming a teacher in, out in Logan County, um, out near Russell Springs. Um, and then, of course, uh, they had Charles Etta, who was my mother, who married my dad, and mom's here now, I know you are, mom. And so my mother and my dad had me. <laughs> so that's how I'm connected <laughs> to Vice President Richard M. Johnson's slave, Tom Johnson. Um, Emmanuel Napier, son-in-law of John Samuels. John Samuels and his wife, Leanna, were the slaves of Vice President Richard M. Johnson's daughter, Ima, Ima Jean. And a um, wonderful story about John. And I can tell you this story because of Lula Craig. And Lula Craig is responsible for working with Barbara Brenner, who wrote that little children's book called Wagon Wheels. It's been used in the Hope Mifflin reading series all over the, the nation. Um, that story is about the moldy boys that grew up in Nicodemus or spent early years in Nicodemus and ended up walking to Solomon, Kansas because their dad left and tried to get a job uh, somewhere other than Nicodemus. And then he sent for the boys uh, to come and he gave them a map and they followed the Solomon River all the way to Solomon, uh, Kansas. But that little story is as a result of Lula Craig, who was the granddaughter of John Samuels. Um, they came, John Samuels, and there were really three major groups that came and the last major group was uh, led by John Samuels and they were in Leavenworth, Kansas uh, when they heard about uh, a man by the name of John Niles who was there soliciting supplies uh, for the people that were destitute in Nicodemus. And he happened to go to the church services that night where they were soliciting supplies. And he thought to himself, we need to go. We need to go uh, with this guy back to, to Nicodemus. And he was soliciting people to, people to also go. Now, a story about John Samuels as it relates to Vice President Richard M. Johnson's daughter uh, during the time that he was a slave is a fascinating story. Um, John Samuels uh, was owned by Ima Jean and her husband, Daniel Pence. And they lived about four or five miles, I don't even think it's that far, um, from the Johnson, Tom Johnson's place, um, her father's place. And um, he jumped the broom with the lady by the name of Leanna. And she was owned by a Pence. She was owned by the uncle of Daniel. Well, he died. And, well, they were allowed to visit each other on Wednesdays and on the weekends. And when her master died, when Leanna's master died, uh, Josiah Pence was his name, when he died, his wife, her name was Luvenia, she decided that she was going to move to Missouri. And so Daniel Pence and Ima Jean, which you named Johnson's daughter, went to uh, Josiah and said, you know, uh, I went to Josiah's wife, Ruvini and said, I know that you want to move to Missouri, but that means that the slave family is going to break up. So why don't you let us buy um, <coughs> Leanna so the family can stay together? She said, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. I want to keep uh, Leanna so she can help me with my children. And so then he said, well, why don't you let uh, us sell you John? She said, I don't need any more slaves. So that's how the family got split up. So Ima Jean and Daniel Pence said to John Samuels, you know, this is a heartbreaking thing. We know the family's going to split, split up, but we will do everything in our power to make sure that the family gets back together. 
took them about two and a half, three years, and they found someone in the western Missouri area that they could sell him to. And in Lula Craig's document, she talks about how the day that uh, John had to say goodbye to his family, um, Ima Jean gave him a pass and said, you go to the pipe, they've left this morning, so you can go on the pipe on this, the road to um, the, uh, the name of the town, which is the, the uh, capital of Kentucky is Franklin. Franklin. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. On the way to Franklin, go to the pike and you should find them. So he took the pass and he went to the pike and he went down the pike and he eventually found the family and he saw them in the wagon and uh, they stopped and he got a chance to say his goodbyes to his wife and his two daughters at the time. And um, he finally got back home and that's when Daniel and Imogene said, we'll do everything in our power to get someone that will buy you in, their, in the area where they're moving, which was Western Missouri. I did not know where they had gone until about five years ago. And I was doing some research and I found out it was Western Missouri. And he became a Christian minister uh, and was an ordained mis minister after emancipation. And so I found out, I can't remember exactly how I found out it was Weston. I went to Weston, Missouri and, and wanted to see if I could find the church or locate the church where he was a Christian minister. And I did. And it was just wonderful. They said, well, this is not the original church, but it was built just like the original one that had burned down. So I found the church where uh, he was ordained a Christian minister. And the reason he was ordained a Christian minister is because during slavery, on Leanna's plantation, which was the Josiah Pence plantation, some of the children were playing, and they were playing down by some mill, and they found a book, and they brought it back, and they showed Leanna, and of course they took the book from, she took the book from the kids, and hid it. And the reason she did was because, you know, you could get punished and or maimed, or even death if you got caught reading or with books or any other material. So she waited until the weekend, until John Samuels came to visit, and she says, I've got a book and I don't know what to do with it. And she did not know that he could read and write. He had learned to read and write in a hemp factory. Um, and there was a runaway slave that had taken refuge with him during the, the winter, and while he was there, he taught all the men in the hemp factory to read and write. And he had never divulged to her that he could read and write. And when she brought him the book, he says, this is the Holy Bible. Oh. And so he took it and secret, secretly read it. And when he uh, left Kentucky, he left it with another slave by the name of Penn, or Pence. And um, so he knew the Bible very well. And so when he ended up in Missouri, he was sold to a man by the name of Henderson. Um, and Henderson went to the Christian church. And uh, the minister found out after emancipation that he could read and he knew the Bible well. And so he ordained him a Christian minister. He never got a chance to have his own church in Nicodemus, but he was very instrumental in starting the school, one of the schools there in Nicodemus. Um, and he participated in the, uh, the Baptist church. Um, he organized the group that came in 1879 in Leavenworth. After emancipation there in Missouri, he stayed there with his wife for a number of years, and then eventually they moved over, crossed the river, to uh, the Leavenworth area. And he was there in 1879 <coughs> when uh, John Niles was there to solicit supplies for Nicodemus. So he organized a group. Most of them were uh, his family. Some of them were the Groves. Some of them were the Greases, um, the Garlands. And they all came out together in 1879. And they were the last big group that were originally from Kentucky. But at that time, it was after emancipation, and they were living in the Leavenworth area. So he was, he was known to be the one that organized those uh, that last group of people that came in 1879. Part of his group was, uh, well, he had three daughters. He had really four daughters and one son. He had a daughter by the name of Mary. Let me start out with the oldest daughter. He had a daughter by the name of Harriet. Um, and Harriet was Lula Craig's mother. Lula Craig is the one that I told you about the manuscript, and that's why I can tell the story. Um, he had a daughter by the name of Mary. Mary married a man by the name of Samuel Garland. 
He was a famous Buffalo soldier that was at Ballon Beach Driver. Um, and he had a son, and he had a daughter named Margaret. And Margaret married a man by the name of Emmanuel <coughs> Napier. And Emmanuel Napier is my great-great-grandfather. Emmanuel Napier actually was killed by Buffalo Bill. He was working on the railroad. And they say that the story is that he came by and he said, watch me shoot this nigger's ear off. And that's the story that my grandmother told, but her first cousin remembers the story as, watch me shoot this lunch pail out of his hand. And I think that story is probably the one that was true because uh, he ended up dying of gang gangrene um, because of his leg, the shot that hit his leg. Um, but that's Emmanuel Mayhew, and that's my great-great-grandfather. Okay, just to give you a little bit of the genealogy I've just kind of been expanding on, John and Leanna Samuel, slaves of, uh, John Samuel, slaves of Daniel and Ima Jean Pence, Vice President Richard M. Johnson's daughter. Um, John Samuel uh, and Leanna had Margaret, who married Emmanuel Napier that you just saw a picture of, who had a son by the name of William Henry Napier, who married Maud Lilly. And then she had Priscilla Bates, who was married to Pearl. Okay, where's the rest of my genealogy? Well, Pearl was my, my father's father. No, I don't know why that didn't get typed on there. But anyway, Pearl was my father's father. And of course, then my father and then me. So you see how my genealogy goes back. And this is Lula Craig, who is the granddaughter of John and Leanna Samuels. Her mother was Harriet, their oldest daughter. And Lula Craig is the one that in 1879, when they came from uh, the Leavenworth area, she thought, she was about 11 years old at the time, and she thought what they were doing at that time was significant enough that she started to record the history of all the people of Nicodemus. So she interviewed and took notes and wrote uh, people and asked them information when they moved away from Nicodemus. And she compiled all that information into a document that is called the Lula Craig Manuscript, which is at the University of Kansas. Uh, the Nicodemus Historical Society, we, all, we also have a copy of it. But all of those stories that I've just told you um, are written in Lula Craig's manuscript. She was hoping to write a book. Um, she never really got to the point where she finished the book, but she wrote the first two chapters. And she talks about the name Nicodemus and where the name of the, the name of the town came from. Although it is a biblical name, that is not where uh, the name came from. It came from um, Nicodemus, who was a slave of African birth and was bought for a bag full of gold. They say he was a prophet, or at least he was that wise, and he talked about a better time for me. And he said that he needed to be woke up for the great Jew Jubilee. So there was a song that the people sang about Nicodemus, and a guy by the name of Henry Warps uh, put the lyrics in, uh, and printed the music up, and it was very, very popular at the time, and they even had a, a dance called the Nicodemus Jig. So if you look back uh, during uh, those uh, years, um, right before emancipation, you start to see that this was a very popular song. So I think that's why they selected the name Nicodemus, because the time had arrived to wake up Nicodemus. But I always like to say there are those similarities, you know, with Nicodemus being a biblical name, and he was the one that was part of the Sanhedrin that went to Christ and said, you know, Christ, you say we need to be born again. How can we be born again? How can we really re-enter our mother's womb? And Christ said, it's not about physical rebirth, it's about spiritual rebirth. So that spiritual rebirth to me happens uh, not only to us in terms of a religious point of uh, uh, a, a view or perspective, but it happens when you come to Nicodemus. It's like you can feel the spirit, you can see and feel the power of the people that settled there, that made their dream a reality. So, and Nicodemus is located really um, in the middle of the United States. We're not really the, the geographic center, but if you took a map of the United States and you folded it and, and you got that T and you opened it up, that's where Nicodemus sits in the promised lands of Kansas, mm. <laughs> settled by people that were called Exodusters, on the Solomon River. And I always say, I had nothing to do with that, but I think the Lord did. <laughs> um, 
In 2007, Vice President Richard M. Johnson's family, all of his siblings, and there was about 10 of them, they give a family reunion like every two or three years. Um, and they are spread all over the United States and a few of them, a few of their descendants are up in Canada. Well, they had a reunion in 2007 and for the first time, they decided they were gonna invite the descendants of the slaves, of the former slaves. And the Johnson family was huge and they were very influential. Uh, you know, they were the aristocracy of Kentucky. And so one of the brothers ended up down in um, Arkansas and there was a big plantation down there that's a historic place. But they decided that in 2007 they were going to have a family reunion and invite the descendants of the slaves. And so I think it was about eight of us from Nicodemus that are direct descendants of Tom Johnson um, and also uh, John and Leanna Samuels. We went to the reunion and I spoke and I told the story and read from Lula's document about how Richard M. Johnson got married to Julia Chen and what Johnson had said to him in terms of getting the music prepared and all of that. And we had it at uh, Ward Hall, which is right in Georgetown. And Ward Hall was actually owned by Sally Ward, who was Richard M. Johnson's daughter. It is a historic uh, mansion there. Uh, they have a foundation and they've been in the works of we totally restoring the building, and it is phenomenal when you go in there because a lot of things are like it was back in the slavery days or antebellum days. When you go down in the basement, there's a wood, um, there's a dirt floor, and you can see the kitchen, and you can see where some of the people that worked there actually slept. It's just a wonderful place to visit and take you back to that time period. Now, people would, a lot of people would say, well, what's so great about that? Their lives. Even though they endured slavery, and slavery was uh, a horrible institution, to not look at their lives is a travesty. Um, we have to look at slavery. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how horrible it was, there, wasn't, there were situations and people that did make a difference. And Johnson did not have to marry his slave. He did not have to. He did not have to publicly educate his daughter. He thumbed his nose to all of those at the time, and he didn't care what people thought. And when Julia Chen died, he married another slave. And now this really is going to sound strange, but he divorced her, even though it wasn't really legal, and he married her sister. <laughs> That's in his uh, biography. Uh, but anyway, so when we reconnected with the, the white descendants of Richard M. Johnson, it was a phenomenal thing. I mean, to stand in a room, and know that we are there as descendants of those people that were masters and slaves was a phenomenal thing to experience. And one of the uh, Johnsons, his name is Richard M., named after his great, great uncle. He lives in Texas. He looks exactly like Richard M. Johnson. And one of the things that we did as a group is we toured the museum there in Georgetown, and they have a, a a plastic, or not plastic, but a, uh, a wax, uh, life-size Richard M. Johnson. And Richard M. stood next to him, he looked exactly like him. It was amazing. But we, we keep in touch, and um, he has a, uh, well, one of the siblings descendants. Uh, she used to work for the Washington Post. She is currently working on a book about Julia Chen and Richard M. Johnson. Um, one of the descendants on the, uh, I'm a Jane side. She didn't find out until she uh, got an artifact that she had any black in her family. When she got this artifact and she found out how this particular artifact related to Richard M. Johnson's daughter, I'm a Jane, who was her great great grandmother, it just blew her mind because she's a white woman that lives in um, Tucson or Phoenix, Arizona. And she was there. No, she lives in Tempe. And she was there at the reunion. And what was really interesting was we divided up into groups to take photographs of you know, all the ones that were descendant of uh, the slaves and family members that were descendant of Richard M. Johnson and his brother Josiah or whoever. So we, we took separate groups, pictures, and then we took one large group pictures. So when, it's, when it was about um, Imogene and Daniel Pence, here's this woman, she, she's dead and 
you know, with all the blacks that are the descendants. And it was just a powerful thing. And many of them cried and apologized for, you know, what their forefathers had done in terms of enslaving them. Um, you know, our, our, our family members. So it was a very powerful thing to experience. But it was, um, it was done in 2007, and over the years since then, we've, we've been in touch with several of the families. Okay, back to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was designated National Park in 1996. In 1998, we celebrated its designation um, with uh, installing the sign that says Nicodemus National Historic Site. Um, the lady that's standing next to me, and I'm on the, this side holding the sign, so to speak, with a brown cowboy hat on. The lady standing next to me is my grandmother. That's my dad's mother. The lady in the red, right on the edge of the picture, is my aunt. Um, and she's deceased. The lady that's on the other side of the sign is your Bob Sayers. And um, Lord forgive me, I can't remember his name. Um, used to be uh, the head of the park service. Used to be over uh, historic black colleges. Lord forgive me, I can't think of his name. But most of the people that you see there, except for me and uh, part of the ladies, are now deceased. So over the years, uh, the population has declined in Nicodemus. Um, and we're really down to about 10 people that actually live on the town site. And although we are a national park, and there's just a few of us that are actually on the town site, that doesn't diminish anything about its history. I mean, you guys are here today to hear about this wonderful story about these two men that were former slaves of Vice President Richard M. Johnson and his daughter. So the history is phenomenal, and the connections are being uh, expanded and connected on uh, such a massive uh, and broad scale as this phenomenal. People that did not know they were related or connected to Nicodemus are finding out. Uh, a lot of people that are doing research on Ancestry.com and, and that kind of thing, they're finding out they've got these connections. So it's a phenomenal thing to meet people that you have never met before that are, are related to you. And the family of Nicodemus is so huge. I had a meeting just yesterday with the park director. She, her name's Angela West. She's a new park uh, superintendent for Nicodemus. And I had a meeting with her to, to discuss with her how important it is that we, the, the descendants of Nicodemus, keep that door open so that we can always connect with potential descendants because it is, the families are huge and the connections are very, very broad. But when you have the Park Service meeting people, not knowing if there's any connection and not being allowed to ask, it prevents us from that opportunity to know who our potential cousins and relatives are. So I just had a meeting with them yesterday. I said, this is what makes Nicodemus unique. I mean, you've got uh, about 60 or 70 families that initially settled in Nicodemus, and then over the years they started marrying each other. Uh, and then what you have is someone in my generation that can trace my genealogy back to those original settlers. Um, and I'm related to all of those people in between. And I remember when I was having a conversation with my mother one day about Lula Craig. And she said, well, you're not Kendra Lula Craig. I said, yes, I am, Mom. She said, no, you're not. And my grandmother, my father's mother, said, yes, Lula Craig is really my first cousin. And, I, and then she explained to me the genealogy. And when she explained the genealogy, then everything clicked. Everything made sense. Um, so it's, it's a phenomenal thing to... To, to, to be connected to this story and to know the family histories and the genealogies that uh, we have there at Nicodemus. And I was a nosy kid when I was young. I wanted to hear all the stories, good and bad. Um, and I wanted to know how I was kin to these boys that I thought were good looking. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's a homecoming. And, and my mother then would say, OK, you're coming from California. We're going to Nicodemus for the big celebration. And these are all your cousins, so don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you're 14, 13, 14, 15 years old, your hormones are going, and you've got a room full of good looking men. <laughs> and your parents said, oh, don't think about it. <laughs> and when I got married to Barry Tompkins, Barry said to me when he attended our first celebration, and I had all my cousins coming up and hugging, because we're all hugs and kisses, he got, he got really upset. And who was that? And, 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 and who was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. You got to tell me all these men are your cousins? 
<laughs> I can attest now that I was telling the truth. But it was very, very difficult him, for him at first. But it is true. So the genealogy uh, of Nicodemus is so intertwined and so interconnected. It's just a phenomenal thing. And to be able to say that I know how I'm related to Gail Sayers. How many of you in here know about Gail Sayers? Did you know he was here in Wichita in his first four or five years of school? Then they moved on to a little town called Speed, where his grandfather was. Well, the family came down from Richardson, um, Nebraska. I almost lost that. Came down from uh, Richardson, Nebraska, uh, with there was a mother and, and five of her sons and one daughter. And one of her sons became the first, I should say, the second county attorney for for, uh, for Graham County. His name was W. L. Sayers. My my father's uh, um, uncle. So W. L. Sayers was uh, uh, had a brother named Roger Day, who is uh, uh, Gail Sayers' uh, great grandfather, I believe. So that's how the and what happened was just to give you a little genealogy. The Bates, two Bates sisters, married two Sayers brothers, and W. L. Sayers was the second county attorney. And they had a brother named Roger, and Roger was a uh, Gail Sayers' uh, great grandfather. So it's it's wonderful. And I don't know how many of you have heard of Girls Whiteser. Yeah. yeah, everybody yeah. seems to know Girls Whiteser. Well, you saw a picture, even though it wasn't that good. You saw a picture of his great his great grandmother. Uh, I, the little girl in the picture that didn't have the head that had the little black dress on. You that? Okay, Clara was my grandfather, Charlie Williams' sister. And their older brother was Henry, first baby born in Nicodemus. And just with that family alone, that family, um, I could take that family and about four other families and get about 90% of Nicodemus descendants. It's a phenomenal thing. Very, very fascinating. And I always get kids to ask me during homecoming, well, Aunt Angie, of course, I'm everybody's aunt, right? When you get past 40 or someone's aunt. Uh, and they know I'm a genealogist, so they will ask me, well, am I? Into so and so, and I'll have to break it down to them. I tell you, like my mama told me, don't think about it, you relate to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's not always true because we do get a lot of people that are not related that come um, to Nicodemus for the big celebration, which is always the last weekend in July. Um, it used to be August the 1st, and then back in the 50s, I believe, that's when my parents moved out and that generation started to move away from the area. It was very difficult for them to get back on August the 1st, especially if August the 1st was during the middle of the week. So they changed it to the last weekend in July. So we expect to see all of you all there then. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but several years back, at least 10, 12 years ago. Um, the first archaeological dig was done by Washburn University. And they actually did the dig out at Tom Johnson's uh, dugout. Now, it was really an amazing thing for me because I'm like, okay, we have a map of the Nicodemus Township. And, you know, there was a dugout there, and there was a dugout there, and there was a dugout there. Okay, there are no dugouts now. Now, how are you going to find a dugout? <laughs> I mean, really. And so we got to the area, and these are all professionals, of course. They know what the dirt looks like and all that. And they said, well, we know it was generally in this area here. Well, they actually did the archaeological dig, and it just amazed me, because when they dug down, they dug down several different spots. And then they got to this one spot, and they dug down, and said, this is where the steps are. And I said, how can you tell? I said, can you see the steps? I said, I guess they look like steps like dirt to me. And what was really amazing to me is when they got to the floor. The floor of a dugout, which is dirt. <laughs> Are you digging in dirt? How do you know you're at the floor? It's the way that the dirt is compacted and all of that. But that just fascinated me. And it was wonderful to be there and see them unearth the dugout where Tom Johnson actually lived. It was just phenomenal. And this is where they had the first true services and all of that. Well, the next year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make a little point here. Uh, because this is important. Uh, 
the professor that headed up that dig was from Washington University. I don't say her name. But anyway, she was doing all of this additional research on, you know, the, the actual land and the land uh, papers and all of that. And she got confused as to who Henry was. She said, well, and she, so she wrote up her report. And um, I said, you got the wrong Henry here. That wasn't the first baby born that was in Nicodemus. That was his nephew that owned this land later on. Well, I couldn't convince her that what I was saying was correct. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, you just don't know what you're talking about because here. And I said no. And then she said, well, on the census it also says that this Mary, who's the mother of Joseph, she's probably the sister-in-law of Tom. No. Her son Joseph was the son of Tom. And, and Mary was his mother. Zarina was the mother of the other children. That didn't make any sense to her. I said, that's probably because you don't know anything about slavery. <laughs> so when we start messing and messing around with genealogies and records like that, and you start to conject your uh, opinion, and you start to think, well, maybe really it's this way now. So I always say, especially to the Park Service, and I just said it yesterday, <laughs> take your dirty shoes off if you're gonna walk around in my genealogy, because you don't know what you're talking about. You know, and, and I don't know where they think they get the right to do that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> she put it on the website a certain way, and I had a hissy fit, and then they put the wrong name on this chart, and I said, no, that's all wrong. And I think people thought I was crazy. You know, why are you making a big, well, it's my family. Yeah. And that's how I feel. And so anyway, I stand for that. But anyway, so the first archeological dig was done by, um, Washington University, and un they unearthed a lot of different things, which was amazing to me. And then the next year, Howard University came, and um, that was really interesting because they had students that looked like me, and they were digging, and they found uh, some additional things. And then the, the third year, Howard University came back, and so our stuff is still at that Howard University, So, and I may have to employ you to go get our stuff, because it needs to be processed, and it needs to be at the State Historical Society. But it's, it's been a wonderful thing um, to, to be a part of that experience of them actually unearthing a dugout. I mean, come on, for real? And to know that underneath that ground they found a bottle. And I think you even saw that bottle that had some whiskey in it. Did you dad? Or did you drink it? <laughs> <laughs> but I think you, but anyway, they unearthed all kinds of things. Um, pieces of uh, dolls, uh, they determined uh, that some of the stuff was uh, some of the food they had eaten, those kinds of things. Anyway, but it was wonderful to have Howard University involved. Any other questions? I have a question you yes. mentioned in your meeting. You mentioned something about meeting with the people from the park registry. Uh, National Park Service. Okay. Why is it that they are not allowed to ask if uh, people are related to you? If I knew the answer, I would tell you. <laughs> I don't know. I, do, I really don't know. They, they have a policy that says you can't, you can't ask personal questions like that, which I think is ridiculous. Because, it, like I say, it prevents us. It steps in between us and the general public that come. So you guys can write that. People that made the policy have the world set up and they get in a certain way. And they're trying to fit you yes. to the end of their path. Yes. And yes. what they don't understand, not yes. only with African Americans, but with other groups. Yes. That, that, their family patterns don't follow. Absolutely. That, that, that pattern they have. Absolutely. And, and culturally, you know, there are so many differences that, um, you know, most people don't, well, I'll say it like this. I am always saying to new Park Service people, especially the superintendent, the way you communicate with us, tell it to us on Sunday morning. If you put it in the newspaper, you're not doing anything other than satisfying your own requirements. And give us a call the day before, maybe even the day of. They can't figure out how I can uh, put on something and get so many people there. Well, what did you do? Well, first of all, they're my cousins, and they better do what I told them. <laughs> um, no, it, it's just I, I am a part of that culture, and I know how we communicate. And I say there's a lot of cultural differences that you guys don't understand. And I said, the first one you need to understand is we are on CP time in our own. So when we say 7 o'clock and we don't show up until 8, ain't nobody upset. 
Nobody's upset. If we say 7 o'clock and nobody shows up till 8, nobody's upset. And if you show up two hours later and? That's just the way it is with us culturally. Am I telling the truth or not? <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen. Another, another question. Um, Daniel Pierce, Pence, Pence? Pence, sorry, was he white? Yes. Then, okay, yes. was a landowner. Yes. Okay. Yes. 2007 when you went to Kentucky. Uh -huh. Why 2007? That was the year that they were having their reunion. And they invited every, the descendants of the slaves to come. And of the three groups that came, the three mm -hmm. large groups, one of them we said was like 300 people. Mm -hmm. Were the other groups? Not quite that large. Okay. The second group probably was about, I think about 15 families. <laughs> um, and the last group was probably less than 100 people that came. And then there were smaller groups that kind of trickled in. Okay, those are my three, thank okay. you. Okay, mm -hmm. any other questions? Yes. Was it the city then primarily um, agricultural or? I'm glad you, you said city. <laughs> it's not really a city. People call it a village. No, it, it's, it's, it's an unincorporated town and it has always been an agricultural community. Mm -hmm. There's no industry there. And still is agricultural. Correct, correct. Yes. So you finished what wonderful book yeah. have been sitting up on the table. Uh -huh. um, have you, have you written this story, and are you going to? It needs to be written. Yes, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> this is a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'll put my help to help myself. I can hold. Oh. <laughs> All right, I've written um, this is turquoise one here, which is called uh, How They Got Mail, Getting Mail. And it's the adventures of Nicodemus Annie. Nicodemus Annie really is me. Um, and it's about how she has a passion for the history and all. And she gets taken back in her dreams by Lula Craig to see Nicodemus at different times. So this one here is about how they got Mel and Nicodemus and how they had to walk the postmaster, who was the first African postmaster in the United States. The first post office that was owned and operated by African Americans in the United States is one of the historic buildings in Nicodemus. Postmaster's name was Zach Fletcher, and he had to walk 35 miles over to Ellis, where the railhead was, and then back. So the story is about how he um, lost the mail and it blew all over the place, but he finally gets it back. And so that's my first book. My whole concept was, like you say, the stories need to be written. Not be to be but so I'm trying to write stories about the five historic buildings first, and then uh, other stories. Uh, that relates to the history, which I could just go on forever. But uh, the other little book he has here is about the first Christmas. That's been fictionalized just a hair, but it's about how they did have uh, the first Christmas tree really was a tumbleweed. And the kind of the ornaments that they put on it were tin and um, uh, uh, ribbon and cotton balls. Um, I have another book that I really split into two, and I'm working on it now, and it's about, it's called New Arrivals, and it's about the story of how people came, who the family members were, how the groups were actually organized, and all of that. And so this story is definitely a part of that, that uh, it's probably just gonna be a, a book that has two parts, an A and a B. Um, I've written, um, most recently, um, I've been writing a story about how they stampeded the cows through Nicodemus. The cowboys did that in 1878 and 79 because um, they just discouraged settlers, you know, putting up fences and all of that. And um, it's a story about how uh, a great big longhorn fell in uh, the dugout, of, and this is all true, of one of the settlers. So I just. I'm in the process of writing that, and that's going to be an adult book. But last year, I finished a, a book about my dad. Uh, my dad was the um, Kansas City Call and Chicago Tribune paperboy in the 1930s, and how he rode his little pony all over the countryside delivering papers. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> and his story was in the Kansas City Call last February. About and my great uncle was the head printer, and we have a historical uh, photograph of him actually in the Kansas City Call at the at the printing press. 
So yes, the story to answer your question, yes. But to follow, can I just follow up with that? Because I've seen the play that you wrote and performed in the Demons, where you had uh, five of the major political figures in the community oh, debating in a political debate. Yes. And it was wonderful. And yes. Something, I mean, these things are resources that could be used here, you know, all over the country. Are they available? Uh, <laughs> uh, I need to get cloned. Uh, what she's talking about is uh, the politicians of Nicodemus. And what I did was I twisted the arms, not very hard, of five of my cousins to do five of the politicians. Edward P. McKay, who was the state auditor here in Kansas, he got his political start right there in Nicodemus Town Company Secretary. Um, W.L. Sayers, who was the second county attorney, G.W. Jones, who was the first county attorney in Grand County, um, who else? Uh, anyway, there's five of them. Oh yeah, Daniel Hickman, who was a part of the group that uh, helped to organize the groups and, and uh, created a, really a lot of the Baptist churches uh, in that area, just not in Nicodemus, but in the area. Um, and I got them all dressed up. I wrote a script for each one of them, and it's phenomenal. I call it the politicians of Nicodemus, and uh, it's just it's phenomenal. We need to do it here. We need to bring them down here Let's do and it. let them do that. Would you guys come? Yes. Okay. There you go. That's your program. Any more questions? Yes. What was the population of Nicodemus after the third large group journey there? Okay, I'll just tell you what it was in its heyday, which was about 1885. There was close. And a couple of ladies are here that I that came to Nicodemus. And I don't, did I give you guys a tour around the Carolina ship? The township that I take you around, which is called the Nicodemus Township, is 36 square miles of land that was settled by African Americans. And when you take that tour, and you can I can point out where the water tower is and everything in between was all settled by black. It's, it's a phenomenal thing to see. It's a phenomenal thing to feel. To know that this much land was actually owned by African Americans. So, yes. Thank you. One more over there. One more over there, yes. I grew up in Stockton. So oh, and what's your last name? Betty Marshall. Betty Marshall. Grew up in Stockton. Stockton is 12, uh, six, 19 miles east. <laughs> About 20, 20 some miles east of Nicodemus. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, I, I just wanted to say I know Wow. And you know what? That's Nicodemus' emancipation celebration was at times bigger than the state fair. It rivaled the state fair. It was so huge. They had baseball games, they had boxing matches, they had horse races, they had political uh, platforms with speakers, and they had two dance platforms, one for the whites, one for the blacks, and I'm sure there was something in between. But it was, it was, a, it was a fantastic uh, celebration. It does not, it's not of that magnitude now, but it's, it's coming. I think your time is gonna come back to that. I may not live to see it, I'll be on the other side, but I'll be there in spirit, but I believe it's coming back. Any other questions? You guys have been a wonderful audience. This was actually a, a, a record-setting presentation. Yes. We have 53 people here. I think it's twice as large as our largest uh, Senior Wednesday ever. So, wow. all right, you got. Before everyone left, and I did this at the last um, Senior Wednesday, but uh, is there anyone here first who's from Alabama? Anybody with Alabama roots? <laughs> Well, I, I want to tell the story because I have Alabama roots. Um, my grandfather was one of 29 kids, and, uh, sort of like you. My dad was really into genealogy, and he had found where we came from in Butler County, Alabama. He began calling people, but when they found out he was black, they stopped taking his calls. So um, I went there this summer for a uh, museum director's conference. It was my first you know, trip into Alabama. And on the last day, I was able to take a tour of what they call the Civil Rights Trail, from Birmingham to Selma, from Selma to Montgomery, and then back to Birmingham. And it was really a moving experience. I felt a lot of what you were talking about when you get reconnected with your history and your past.
But when I was in Selma, there was so much Kansas history there. Um, there was a white Universalist Unitarian minister from Wichita killed in Selma. When Dr. King was calling people, clergy, to come in, and we might not have the Voting Rights Act today, but for James Reeb's martyrdom. So we went around a corner and there was a Rexall drugstore. Well, the first successful student-led sit-in was here in Wichita, and it had to do with the Rexall chain. So I was looking at the drugstore in Selma and thinking that people in Wichita liberated that place. And then lastly, uh, we saw plaques at two or three stops. Reference last name was Johnson. I'm not sure if he was related to you. <laughs> but his name was Frank Menace Johnson. Dr. King called Judge Johnson the face of justice in this country because it was Judge Johnson who ruled in favor of Rosa Parks and the Montgomery Improvement Association. Uh, it, he also said that you can take that march from Selma to Montgomery uh, over the objections by President Eisenhower, who as a matter of policy would not appoint segregationists to the federal bench. But more of us here needed to do this because more people need to come to our state and learn about all this awesome history that we have here. All that said, I am promoting a tour. We're going to fly to Birmingham and then take the very same tour that I took. There's a wonderful lady in Selma. I can't wait for everybody to meet. But um, she, put, she puts you in your place as soon as you arrive. She gets on the bus and says, okay, when I talk, you don't talk. When you talk, I don't talk. And when we go into some of these sketchy neighborhoods, when I run, you run. <laughs> But she was actually at that march in Selma over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. She said the people on that bridge, like her, were beaten off the bridge, down the street, and back to the church. She said, she, she said the beatings went on all evening. She saw a teenage boy picked up and thrown through the baptismal wall. And it broke both of his arms. She's very connected with all that history. And it's surprisingly undeveloped for all the history there because people are resisting the telling of this story. There's a lot of shame and a lot of anger tied up in a lot of this history. So I wanted to offer all of you these flyers. Um, we've made it as affordable as we possibly could, and you can pay on it and install these that are going. And I have the flyers here. It's in June. It's June 12th through the 14th. So I have these here. And thank you once again for coming to our museum. And come. Let's give